14 years ago, I was at home with four little kids, and the youngest was a serial vomiter. That serial with an S as an over and over again, and serial with a C because there was definitely Cheerios in the mix multiple times. Now, his name is Jack, and he threw up so often, and then he would just go right back to eating as if nothing had happened. So we started calling him Yak and come back. <laughs> now, my fancy MBA didn't offer any particular insights into how to solve this daily vomitosis thing that we had going on. So I spent the better part of a year cleaning up after Jack. As all the mothers in this room can imagine, this was a not a very glamorous era for me, you know, Play-Doh in the hair, vomit smeared in the jeans. But I was managing the problem in that I sort of knew how to do. I bought a carpet shampooer, to, you know, of course, lots of disgusting laundry. But it wasn't until Jack provided this particularly dramatic display, essentially booting all over the table at a restaurant, when a stranger asked a question, might that kid be allergic to milk? hadn't even occurred to me. All that time cleaning up after Jack, I hadn't once stepped back and asked, is what I'm feeding him making him throw up? Well, of course, the next day, I pulled milk and a bunch of other common allergens out of Jack's diet, and he stopped throwing up that day. This was awesome but it was also cringeworthy because I felt so ashamed that I had let this go on for so long, like poor little guy. But it was a real awakening for me too, just the starkest of evidence that the food we put into our bodies really matters. And I don't mean just with like food sensitivities and food allergies, but in general. So I got really interested in that connection between what we eat and wellness. Now, as parents, <laughs> We spend a lot of time, energy, money, feeding our kids. I don't know about you guys, my kids, it's like they expect dinner every single night. <laughs> they are relentless, so much work. So you know, if you're gonna spend all that time and all that energy, you might as well get it right. And in my house, getting it right has been about making changes. I'm happy to report that Jack is back to milk and all those food sensitivities are a distant memory. But we still don't eat the way most Americans eat. We're part of a global food revolution, lower carb, higher fat. Let me explain more. Most of you know we're in the midst of an obesity epidemic, but I'm not sure that you've all seen it displayed this way. The red line on the graph is obesity ramping up beginning about 1980, essentially tripling, and the green bars show diabetes rates rising even faster. Now, diabetes is one of those chronic diseases that travels with obesity, and there are several others, heart disease, stroke, fatty liver, some kinds of cancer, even dementia and Alzheimer's, all tightly linked to obesity, what we're eating, and they're all on the rise. Our healthcare um, system is managing this problem, and they're doing a decent job of that, but in terms of reflecting on cause and prevention, not so much. So they're kind of like me on the floor, cleaning up after Yak and come back, cleaning up our mess. So today I'd like to step back and, and really talk about what could possibly be driving this. Now, obesity experts, you've probably seen them on CNN, they will talk about a obesogenic environment or how we've become victims of our own prosperity. And the idea is like too many cheap and easy calories, 24-7 food on every corner. It's just too hard to resist. And then not enough reason to move. So the idea is too many calories in, not enough calories out. And of course, the cure for this is to eat less and to exercise more. I'm sure you've all heard this advice. Unfortunately, eating less and exercising more only work for most people in the short term. The science is actually pretty clear on this. For long-term weight loss, neither eating less nor exercising more works terribly well for most people. So we have a broken theory of obesity, and the solutions that come out of that theory are, of course, broken too. What can we learn by looking back to the 1970s and 60s before obesity took off? Well, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, so I can give you a little eyewitness report of what it was like. And a lot of things were really the, very similar. 
Uh, there was a lot of soda in my house, certainly tons of driving around in cars, plenty of screen time, uh, lots of cookies from the grocery store and crappy food. There was some fast food, not as much, I admit. But um, one of the things that was distinctly different in my house was my mother's attitude about food. She believed that carbohydrates were uniquely fattening. She kind of came of age in the 40s, and most women from that era believed this. So when she was on a diet, she would uh, keep eating her bacon and eggs at breakfast, but she would give up all the starches at lunch, no dessert, no bread, that sort of thing. And this worked pretty well for whole generations of women. Uh, she also had interesting ideas about exercise. She would say things like, sweating is for horses. <laughs> she, I, I can't believe she would say that, but she did. And she, would, she also would no more consider regular exercise than she would consider giving up her regular gin martini, right? And, and interestingly, there were no gyms, no yoga pants, but a fairly sedentary suburban population maintained their weight um, eating this way and living this way. But since the 70s, the skirts have gotten shorter. I don't want to do that. But, you know, the top's tighter and shorter, too. There's nowhere to hide. We all have incredible incentives to maintain our weight. Yet, look at that graph. 25% of adults moved from lean to obese in just four decades. Not many people would make that journey without a fight. We didn't just sort of drift towards obesity because of the awesome smells coming out from the golden arches everywhere. We were pushed. A big shove, in fact, from our friends at the USDA. So the USDA recommended a low-fat diet around 1980. You probably remember it. It was that food pyramid, which came about 10 years later, but the same thing. All those starches and grains on the bottom and the tiny triangle of fat on the top. So we were supposed to eat less of the fat and more of the carbohydrates, and we did just that. In America, this becomes an even more processed diet, too, because suddenly we have to invite the food manufacturers in to take the natural fat out of our food and also to process all those grains because most people aren't eating like boiled wheat berries or a boiled potato. They're eating a cracker, which is a very processed piece of food. The USDA didn't seem to understand that carbohydrates make most people hangry. You guys know hangry, right? That edgy, crabby, oh my god, I have to eat right now feeling that all comes together. This is the feeling you get when your blood sugar is crashing down after a meal that has been kind of a low-fat, high-carb meal. If you think of anything made out of flour, uh, pretzels, cookies, crackers, bread, all of those things turn to sugar in your body almost immediately after you eat them. So you get a bigger blood sugar spike than you would get from eating table sugar, in fact. Everyone's a little different. I'm going to show you what my blood sugar looks like after eating grape nuts, skim milk, and a banana. That's the red line, my wild grape nuts adventure, right? And then the green line is my blood sugar after eating an omelet. So very different, same amount of calories, very different experience. And I have to tell you, when you come crashing down from your wild ride, you often have to grab that banana nut muffin at 11 o'clock because you just can't make it to lunch. You're hangry. Or God forbid, you go for that Snickers bar in your desk, right? This eating pattern has made us a nation of snackers, which our food manufacturers love because it drives their revenues. And part of why this is happening is because carbs put you into fat storing mode. And by that I mean they drive up a hormone called insulin, really important hormone, does several things. But one of the things it does is it tells your fat cells, hang on to your fat. Don't let the fat out of your fat cells. So you can't access your fat for energy. So that there's no access to that pantry within, as I like to call it. So you have to reach into your external pantry when you get hangry, and you reach for the wheat thins or the granola bar or the energy drink. More carbs. It's a vicious cycle. So hundreds of scientists, thousands of doctors, millions of people have figured this out, 
and have abandoned the low-fat dietary advice and are going back to real full-fat food. They love how cutting way back on sugars and starches makes them feel. This is the grassroots revolution that I'm talking about here today. Sometimes uh, when I criticize the dietary guidelines, which I so often do, a skinny person will say to me, but you can't blame the dietary guidelines. People aren't even following them. Really? Hot off the presses, the USDA just dropped this report comparing what we're eating now to what we ate in 1970. And it's a per person comparison. As you can see on the slide, we're eating more skim milk, more chicken, more vegetable oil, more fresh fruit, more fish and shellfish, more flour, and more vegetables. We're eating less whole milk, red meat, animal fat, and eggs. Sound familiar? It should, because this is what our federal government is telling us to eat, right? <laughs> we have achieved the my plate paradigm. It's just that we're eating too much, and we're kind of eating too much sugar, too. We're cheating a bit. Why, then, are we eating too much? I'll say it again, because carbs make us hangry, and the food manufacturers shove sugar into everything. You can see this for yourself. Swap out whatever you eat for breakfast, whether it's granola or maybe a bagel or low-fat yogurt. Swap it out for three eggs fried in butter. If you're a big strapping guy, maybe you need six eggs to feel full, and you just go for it. But see how you feel three or four hours later. For most people, this is a game changer, self-included. Getting rid of that carb-fested breakfast and eating food that has a lot of fat and protein in it just gives you this beautiful, steady energy. You get all the way to lunch without hangry. It's awesome. Try it. Trust me. And, you know, unfortunately, most Americans are afraid to eat this way. They're afraid of the saturated fat and the cholesterol in the bacon and eggs and butter for breakfast. I have four things to tell you about heart disease and saturated fat. Number one, the nation's perhaps most prominent cardiologist, Dr. Stephen Nissen, out of the Cleveland Clinic, came out last year and called the dietary guidelines an evidence-free zone and particularly called out the relationship between saturated fat and heart disease, questioning that there was any science to back it up. Number two, we have several very large meta-analyses where they roll up hundreds of thousands of subjects in studies showing us that there's no association between dietary fat consumption and deaths due to heart events. Number three, journalists have done some in interesting uh, investigative reporting in the last year and letting us know that, oh, by the way, the sugar industry played a little dirty back in the 60s and 70s and actually pay, made some payments to scientists that kind of put the thumb on the scale a little bit as they were deliberating whether to blame heart disease on sugar or saturated fat. And obviously, the sugar industry was trying to push the blame away from sugar towards saturated fat. And then the fourth thing is just that researchers have done some investigative uh, science and found a study that was buried. It was a well-done study in the late 60s and 70s, and it showed that as people switched from butter to polyunsaturated corn oil, they actually had more heart disease and more death than the people that stayed with the butter. The idea that saturated fat causes heart disease is based on really thin science that keeps getting thinner, but unfortunately, it's an idea that refuses to die. I believe that it will go down probably as the biggest public health mistake in human history. And uh, the faster we can forget about that idea, probably the better. Because it's just shifted our attention away from sugar and refined carbohydrates towards fat. Now, entire countries are experimenting, fortunately, with this way of eating. Sweden, it's called LCHF, low carb, high fat. About a quarter of the population is going rogue, ignoring their dietary guidelines and eating this way. They've had some butter shortages in Stockholm, a little smuggling of butter, which I find very amusing. The interesting bottom line, though, is that over the last 10 years, as butter consumption has soared in Sweden, heart disease rates have fallen. One of the great things about cooking this way, as you can see, it's all real normal food. 
Uh, you can do it really quickly. Vintage, full fat eating is the original fast food. You can fry a pork chop, saute some onions, melt some butter on your frozen peas, done in 15 minutes. It's faster than going to McDonald's. And not only does it taste better and make you more satisfied than a low fat meal, adding fat to your meals makes them, can make them simple too. This is great for parents who have to make dinner night after night after night. I've been speaking about this for a couple of years and I got some nice reports back. Some people have told me about meaningful weight loss, which is great. The most common comment probably is how great it is to live life without that hangry feeling coming up all the time. But my favorite story is a mom that I actually know. She had seen me speak a few months ago and went home and made a bunch of changes. This mom's a really good cook. Uh, but like most American mothers, she was skimping on the butter and was actually cooking broccoli for her family using Pam cooking spray. Well, she swapped it out for butter and served it up for her family, and her teenage daughter took one bite and said, oh my God, Mom, this is the best broccoli you've ever made. What did you do to it? I love that story. I mean, getting your little kids to eat their veggies with butter is awesome. But pleasing a teenager with butter, priceless. <laughs> Imagine with me that the United States is a huge cruise ship. And we've got millions of people, of course, and tons of food. The USDA is doing the cooking. Excellent. Plenty of processed carbs and vegetable oil on all the ample buffets. Now the ship is headed straight for an iceberg of chronic disease. And it's really hard to turn such a big, heavy ship. But fortunately, there are just lifeboats all around the ship, and they're serving up a different kind of food. It's all whole, real food, and it's all full fat. But the thing is, you got to jump off the ship and get in that lifeboat to eat at those alternative tables. Now, there are millions of Americans in the lifeboats already. See all those guys who aren't wearing shirts? They're the paleo dudes. They're showing off their six packs, just so you'll know how great it is to be down there. But the average mother, unfortunately, she's back on the ship. She's pouring skim milk on her cornflakes, maybe putting margarine on a piece of whole wheat toast, chasing it down with a glass of orange juice, wondering why she's hangry all the time, or worse, wondering why she has type 2 diabetes. Mothers are risk averse. We're afraid to grab our families, break the rules, and get into those lifeboats. So much for women and children first, right? But anyway, what I'm asking all of you eaters in this room to reconsider is could going back and eating the way your great-grandmother ate, minus the margarine and the Crisco, could that really be riskier than the obvious health, public health disaster we have going on right now? I mean, there's something seriously wrong with our food paradigm. And I hate to tell you, but quinoa and kale alone will not solve this problem. You've got to protect your family from these modern epidemics by going back to something that we know works, real full-fat food. So join the revolution. Take back your plate. I'll see you on the lifeboats. <laughs>